Was the Eucharist always celebrated the way it is today? What could be the various factors that influence the development of the one thing that is central to the Catholic Church? In this video, we shall explore the rich history behind the development of the Eucharist. Let us begin by revisiting the time when the Israelites were held captive in Egypt. Moses instructed the Israelites about how they could save themselves from dying. The slaughter of the lamb and consumption of the Passover meal. The Israelites continued to observe the directives given by Moses for the Passover meal even after they arrived into the Promised Land. With time, as they kept experiencing struggle and oppression, the Passover began to anticipate the coming of the Messiah. More than a thousand years later, Jesus preached the gospel of love and mercy. Moreover, he instituted the Eucharist when he gathered with his disciples for the Passover. Since the Jewish leaders refused to accept him and his teachings, they sought to eliminate him. Thus, he became the new Paschal Lamb, sacrificed to save us from death. The early Christians then comprehended that they no longer needed to shed the blood of another sacrificial lamb. Instead, in keeping with the words of Jesus, do this in remembrance of me. They only had to take bread and wine and repeat the words and actions of Jesus. This action made present for them the power of Christ's death and resurrection. The experience of the two disciples on the way to Emmaus led to the development of the pattern for the rite of the breaking of the bread. In Christ opening the scriptures to the two disciples in his prayer of thanks at the meal and in the breaking of the bread, the early church discerned a pattern for celebrating the Eucharist. As the number of Christians grew, the Eucharist was no longer celebrated at a common meal, but independent of it. This is made evident through the writings of St. Justin about the Eucharist in 150 AD, wherein there is no mention of a meal. As Christianity began to spread, the language of the Eucharist began to shift from Aramaic to Greek. Mass prayers were probably modelled on Jewish Passover prayers of remembrance, praise and thanks, and on those commonly used in the synagogues, such as the Holy, Holy, Holy. Some Hebrew words such as Amen and Alleluia are still used in our prayers. Christians began to meet at private homes where bishops assisted by priests and deacons led the people in worship. Due to the persecution, the Eucharist had also to be celebrated in secret locations like the catacombs, which were underground burial places. As the persecution increased, the early Christians had to face immense oppression, with many being buried alive in the catacombs. A major shift in history was the emergence of Constantine, an army general as the emperor of the Roman Empire. He credited his military victories to Christ's interventions and in 313 AD issued the Edict of Milan, a proclamation which granted religious tolerance to Christians. He donated many public buildings in Rome and many other cities to the church for worship. From the secret worship in private houses, the scene shifted to churches where large crowds could assemble. This necessitated a more organized liturgical structure. The church began to develop orders of worship and ceremonies for the celebration of sacraments. Liturgical music 
mostly in the form of plain chant, grew in importance. As the Roman Empire began to decline, the invading barbarian tribes, which had no written language, were inclined to adopt the Latin language of the Roman bishops and administrators, making Latin the language of the liturgy. At first, the church allowed much variety according to the region one lived in. However, Gregory the Great, who served as Pope in the early 6th century, brought about more structure and form in the liturgy. He organized the ritual guidelines and a pattern of song very similar to the one currently in use. The custom of the priest improvising the Eucharistic prayers at each Mass had been replaced in Rome by a fixed formula or canon, which developed over time into what we now know as the first Eucharistic prayer. Though the elaborate ceremonies developed by Gregory remained localized in Rome, the Roman liturgy in time would become the norm for the church in the Western world. Having said that, we shouldn't overlook the contribution of political factors. After Emperor Constantine, it was King Charlemagne in the early 8th century who made a significant contribution to the spread of the Roman liturgy. As a devout Catholic, he saw in the Roman liturgy a source of unity for the diverse areas he ruled over. With the assistance of a monk, Alcuin, he oversaw the spread of the Roman liturgy throughout his empire, which spread over most of Western Europe. Some of the practices which can be attributed to his contribution include the recitation of the creed on Sundays and holy days, the use of unleavened bread for the Eucharist, the practice of kneeling to receive communion on the tongue, the ringing of bells, a gradual separation of the altar from the people, and an increase in gestures such as genuflections, the sign of the cross, and incensing. Ever wondered why the altar is set apart from the congregation? Well, that too has an interesting story. Kings such as Charlemagne were set apart from the people on lofty thrones and Christ was seen as the greatest king of all, with the altar being his throne. The altar was placed against a highly ornamented wall so that it might be surrounded with decorations. The priest then prayed with his back to the people, as those celebrating Mass in the catacombs had done. However, things began to change after the death of Charlemagne. Over time, different areas of Europe developed their own language and Latin fell into disuse in everyday life, except among the clergy and educated laity. Soon, only the priest could read the scriptures and prayers in Latin and ordinary people came to Mass more as spectators than as participants. Eventually, there emerged one Latin missal, first in Germany and eventually in Rome. Though the forthcoming centuries didn't see any major changes in the liturgy, historical circumstances a lack of education among the common people, confusion caused by heresies and other factors kept the participation of the people to a minimum. Chant at the Mass was limited to the priest and choir while the people listened. Furthermore, the reception of communion, which had been declining for several centuries, declined further with some people receiving communion only on their deathbed. While people were reluctant to receive the host, they wanted to see Christ in the sacramental species. So the elevation of the host and chalice after the consecration became common practice. Let's look at modern history now. The Protestant revolt led by Martin Luther in 1517 AD shocked Catholic leadership into reforming the liturgy and the church 
which had become lax due to corruption and scandals. Pope Pius V, who was Pope after the Council of Trent, promulgated a new Roman Missal in 1570 AD, and it was made obligatory for a majority of the Western Church. Latin was the only language allowed, and changes to the approved text were forbidden. It established a pattern for the Mass which remained almost unchanged until the middle of the 20th century. However, even in this Missal, the participation of the congregation was minimal. From the 16th to the 18th century, detailed guidelines were laid down on rubrics. Out of the fear that deviations might creep into the liturgy, the translation of the Latin Missal into other languages was forbidden. Increasingly, the laity began to view the Mass as something to be attended, rather than a sacramental action in which they had a significant role to play. The 20th century brought about a new understanding of the Eucharist. Pope St. Pius X insisted on the importance of frequent, even daily communion. The Roman Missal was translated into many vernacular languages for use by laity, allowing them to follow and understand the prayers of the Mass. Pope Pius XII in 1947 encouraged active participation by the members, the people as well as the priest, setting the stage for the Second Vatican Council. The Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy or Sacrosanctum Concilium was promulgated in 1963 and it called for a number of changes. The rites were to be simplified, the liturgical books revised and a place made for languages other than Latin. The Second Vatican Council allowed priests to celebrate Mass in the local language, thus making this key sacrament more accessible in the contemporary world. In 1964, Pope Paul VI set up a commission of bishops and a panel of experts who would carry out the actual work of restoring the liturgy. By 1969, the Novus Ordo Missae, or the New Order of the Mass, allowed priests for pastoral reasons to face the assembly gave the celebrant a variety of Eucharistic prayers, restored the sign of peace to the entire congregation, allowed for distribution of both the body and blood of Christ under the forms of bread and wine, and moved tabernacles off the altars to a noble and prominent location elsewhere in the church or a separate chapel. In 1970, the Pope promulgated the new Roman Missal. The Roman Missal has since been updated, with the translation issued in 2010 being a more faithful rendering of the original Latin with responses like, and with your spirit, as well as words in the I Confess, Gloria, Creed, and other significant parts of the Mass. Though the languages and ceremonies have evolved through the centuries, the essence of the Mass remains the same. Jesus. It is the same Mass today as it was for the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. I do hope you found this video helpful in gaining a deeper understanding of the history of the Eucharist and will help you come closer to our Lord Jesus Christ. Do write in the comment section any fun facts that you would know about the history of the Eucharist. Take care and God bless.